Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. All right, welcome back to part two on my lecture on chapter five. We are now going to move into the different types of biomes, uh, and we're going to talk about each of them in, in, a, in a bit more detail. So first, we're going to talk about deserts. Uh, there are three types of deserts out there, and again, we'll talk about them now. Uh, what's a desert? Well, a desert is where the annual precipitation is low and scattered unevenly throughout the year. So the three types of deserts we're going to talk about are the tropical deserts, the temperate deserts and the cold deserts. Desert ecosystems are vulnerable to disruption. Why? Because they're slow plant growth and low species diversity in deserts. Okay, you uh, plants that do grow take a long time to grow in deserts because of the lack of water. Uh, and we don't have a lot of biodiversity in deserts, again, mainly because uh, we're not seeing uh, uh, that much water in deserts. There's also slow nutrient cycling, uh, again, because of that lack of water. So because because of that, uh, any disruptions to deserts uh, take a long, long time to heal, and as a result, those desert ecosystems are vulnerable to uh, disruption. All right, let's take a look at the three uh, types of deserts. Now, what we're looking at here is a climograph. Well, first, you have a picture uh, of this type of desert. So these, uh, first, we're going to talk about the tropical desert, uh, but on the right there is a climograph. So these are going to be important for you to understand. Uh, you're going to have to be able to link kind of climographs uh, to uh, the a certain biome that they're representing. So what do we see here? Uh, the red line is your mean monthly temperature. Uh, you'll notice in degrees Celsius are uh, running up the left hand side there. And the blue, and you don't see a lot of the blue on this uh, climograph here, but the blue is actually showing us our mean monthly precipitation, uh, which is running up the right side. And then of course on there on the x axis are your months of the year. So you'll notice the tropical desert, what are what's its climate? Well, we have very very high temperatures throughout the year. You'll notice the freezing point there. So you'll notice the red line uh, basically above 20 degrees Celsius for the entire year. And we also have very, very little rain or, or, or precipitation. You'll notice a little bit of a 25, right? A little bit here, about 25 millimeters, November, December. And then January, it kind of uh, falls off. And most of the uh, most of the months here, we're not seeing any precipitation in the tropical desert. So tropical desert, warm temperatures year round, very little precipitation year round. Second type of desert is the temperate desert. So again, you can imagine the tropical deserts will be more towards the equator in tropical regions. Temperate deserts are kind of going to be in those middle latitudes. Let's say that 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south uh, latitude that we talked about uh, in part one of this lesson. So what does the climograph look like for a temperate desert? Well, you'll notice the temperature uh, still gets warm, but you'll notice uh, for this one, which is obviously a northern hemisphere temperate desert, in the winter, uh, the temperatures do get close to that freezing mark. So definitely a little bit colder uh, of a temperature in a temperate desert, uh, if you talk around year round compared to a tropical desert. And you'll notice while the precipitation is still low, uh, maybe a little higher than the tropical desert, right? Where it seems to be, we seem to be getting a little bit of precip during every month of the year in a temperate desert, uh, but still the precipitation uh, is obviously very low and that's why it's considered a desert. Uh, final type of desert is the cold desert. Uh, this would occur, um, this is like the Arctic tundra type of, of desert, okay? This would occur uh, in the northern or southern latitudes, but close to the north or south pole. You'll notice uh, this is obviously a northern hemisphere because we're seeing the warm temperatures June, July, and August. Temperatures do get warm in a cold desert during the summer, but you'll notice in the winter time, uh, temperatures can get well below freezing, uh, well below that zero degree Celsius line uh, in the winter in a cold desert. And once again, the precipitation, very similar to the temperate desert precipitation, uh, pretty much low throughout the year. You may get some precip every month of the year, uh, but pretty much under 25 uh, millimeters of precip per month. So again, very, very dry. Okay, those are your three types of desert. So again, kind of understand those climographs. Uh, if you see a climograph, you should be able to tell if it's a, a desert or a forest or a grassland uh, biome. And again, we're going to talk about all that uh, as we go through the next few minutes. So <clears throat> 
Uh, this is the Science Focus 5.1 in your book, Staying Alive in the Desert, Desert Survival Adaptations. Uh, basically, plant water conservation, very important because well, as we saw in those climate graphs, you're not getting a lot of precipitation during the year in a desert, uh, so you need to conserve any water that you happen to get. So plants do that. Uh, they do that by dormancy, okay, going to sleep when it's very dry, having very, very deep roots in a desert. Uh, most of your are, are plants in the desert, they don't have shallow roots. They have very deep deep root to try to get down and find that water. Uh, they store water in their leaves, which helps. Uh, waxy leaves uh, help reduce water loss. So in deserts, any leaves are usually waxy. And they actually, uh, plants open their pores only at night in the desert. Uh, when plants open their pores, that allows for moisture to kind of move out of the plant uh, out and in. Well, there's not a lot of moisture to move in. You don't want a lot to move out. Uh, so they actually open their pores only at night, keep them tightly closed during the day uh, when the temperatures are the hottest. So those are the plant adaptations uh, for desert life. Here are some animal adaptations. Uh, hiding in cool burrows or rocky crevices by day. You don't see a lot of animal activity in the desert during the day. Most of the activity is at night. Once again, that dormancy, sleeping when it's very hot, very dry. Uh, camels drink massive amounts of water and store them, right? Those are those humps. Right, on those camels storing that water. And reptiles have thick outer coverings that actually minimize water loss. Uh, and that's how reptiles can stay alive uh, in the desert. So just some adaptations that evolution uh, has provided for uh, creatures or for plants that happen to live in, in deserts. All right, the next type of biome we'll talk about are the grasslands. Once again, there are three types of grasslands. So grasslands exist in the interior of continents. Grasslands are kind of in the middle, okay? They're going to be too moist to be deserts, but they're going to be too dry to be forests, okay? Forests with big trees, you need a lot of water to support uh, very tall trees, right? Uh, so grasslands are kind of in the middle. They're not as dry as deserts, but they're not as moist uh, as, as your forests are going to be. And once again, there are three types of Grasslands, main types. You're tropical, you're temperate, and you're cold. Again, Arctic tundra, okay, uh, just north of the Arctic tundra, that's the desert. Uh, you can kind of argue that the tundra kind of could be a grassland, could be a desert, uh, depending on the actual amount of precipitation. So again, uh, kind of kind of the same there. Uh, but again, the, uh, the, the cold deserts would have a little, little, little less rain. Uh, the Arctic tundra, the cold grasslands would, would have a little bit, a little bit more rain or snow. Again, a little bit more precipitation. So let's take a look at the tropical grasslands. These are known as the savannas. Uh, when you think about Africa, this is what you think about, right? That picture with, uh, you have uh, zebras there kind of roaming the grassy plains, eating that grass. And you'll notice if you look at the climograph for a tropical grassland, once again, hot year round, Okay, you don't see a lot of dips in temperature. It's pretty much hot throughout the year. And you'll notice in the grasslands, in the this is again a northern hemisphere, you'll notice that in the winter months, you do get some precip, and it's, and it's more precip than you would get uh, in, the, in the deserts. But in the summer months, the precip drops off uh, rather, rather uh, dramatically here, right? So you do get some very, very dry periods in the grassland. And when I get to the forest next, you'll notice that you don't get this dry period for the forest, okay? So this is why grasslands are a little bit drier than forests. We still get rain uh, in the grasslands, but we also get seasonal drought or areas or, or months when you're not going to get any rain uh, in that tropical grassland. Looking at the temperate grasslands, and this is what we'd call the prairies. Okay, this may be something that you're that you would see uh, in the U.S. here in the, in the in the central states. Okay, once again, looking at the climograph, you have zero degrees. Okay, so cold in the winter months. And again, I know this is the northern hemisphere because it's cold in January, February, November, and December. But it still gets rather warm in the summer. Okay, in these temperate grasslands, and you'll notice the precipitation, while it is a little less here or there, uh, generally much more than you would get, uh, excuse me guys, uh, much more than you would get in that desert, okay, and a little more, a uh, little more in the way of general precip in the temperate grassland, you know, year round uh, than you saw in the tropical grasslands, which had that dry period during the summer months. All right, the cold grasslands, the Arctic tundra, uh, again, kind of that borderline between the desert uh, and these uh, what we call cold grasslands. Uh, once again, you'll notice the climograph, very cold during the winter months, but gets above freezing during during the summer months, okay? And you'll notice your precip, yeah, again, this is why I kind of say 
that the tundra kind of borders the desert because if you remember the cold desert, uh, I would argue that the precip was kind of the same, okay? Maybe slightly more precip in the cold grassland, but uh, but again, you're not talking about a lot of lot of precipitation, not a lot of rain or snow here uh, in the Arctic, uh, those cold grasslands, okay? Uh, so those are your three types of grasslands. And again, this kind of just... Uh, verbally puts out what we spoke about with the climographs, your tropical savannas, warm temperatures year round, you get your grazing and your browsing animals. Again, that's the uh, traditional African safari, African savanna uh, that we think about. Then you have the temperate uh, grasslands, cold winters, hot, dry summers. So similar to the uh, central plain states here in the U.S., tall grass prairies or short grass prairies, depending, uh, and they're often converted to farmland, okay? And we'll talk about why that's an issue, uh, but your temperate grasslands often uh, converted to farmland, and that's exactly what happens uh, in the middle of the United States. And here is an example of that. Uh, this actually is a biodiversity killer. When you have one type of crop growing in a field, it completely uh, degrades your biodiversity. And we're going to talk about this more when we talk about farming. We're going to do a whole unit on how, that, how uh, to best farm for sustainability. Believe it or not, this type of farming you're seeing right here is not good for sustainability because, again, having only one type of crop over a large, large area completely destroys your, your biodiversity. Uh, and, again, we'll talk about that more coming up. Arctic tundra, plants close to the ground to conserve heat. Most grow in that short summer. Animals there have thick fur, and you have something called permafrost, which uh, the underground soil, soil actually stays frozen uh, year-round. Uh, and then something called the alpine tundra. This is the same type of thing, but just in mountains. So you could have these at, 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 at a lower latitudes. Uh, again, above the tree line in mountains, we call that the alpine tundra. All right, so those are your types of grasslands. We'll now move into my favorite biome, the chaparral, a dry temperate biome. So a chaparral occur in coastal regions that border deserts, dense growths of low growing evergreen shrubs, some small trees with leathery leaves, but again, there's not a lot of rain, so you can't get large trees in the chaparral biome. Uh, soil is very thin. Uh, and it's adapted to and maintained by occasional fires. So fires actually help uh, maintain these chaparrals. What's the best example of a chaparral biome? California, especially uh, near the coast uh, in, in Los Angeles and San Francisco. So here it is. If you've ever been to California, uh, this is exactly what it looks like. Italy also, I'm not sure how many of you have, have traveled overseas. Uh, Italy looks a lot like this as well, uh, this, this kind of chaparral, this dry uh, temperate biome. All right. So that's the chaparral, uh, rather quick, uh, but again, just think of, think of kind of California uh, when you think of that chaparral biome. All right. Finally, we'll talk about forests. There are three types of forests. All right, what are forests? They are lands dominated by trees. And once again, what are the three types? Similar to grasslands and deserts, you have your tropical, you have your temperate, and you have your cold, uh, which would be the northern coniferous and boreal forest. Coniferous, uh, obviously, pine trees, okay? Those are what coniferous trees are. Deciduous trees are the ones we have here in Ardsley, uh, which lose their leaves uh, in the fall season. So once again, tropical rainforest. Here's your picture. Here's your climograph. What do you notice? You'll notice warm year round, and you'll notice a lot of precipitation. All right, maybe it dips a little bit uh, in some months, uh, but in general, you're talking about a lot of rain in a tropical rainforest, right? All right, what about the temperate deciduous forest? Well, again, look at your climograph. This is kind of like Ardsley, all right? We do get close to freezing as an, as an average or mean monthly temperature during the winter months, but obviously in the summer, we are nice and warm. And then you take a look at the precip, and it's moderate precip, and basically that precipitation could happen any time throughout the year. So it's not like in a temperate uh, deciduous forest. It's, it's dry one part time of the year, very wet at another part. No, it's pretty much average throughout the year. You get rain every month. And again, when you think of your temperate deciduous forest, think about Ardsley. Think about what we're seeing uh, here in New York State. Uh, the northern coniferous forest or the boreal forest or taiga, again, all three of these uh, names are the same. You'll notice the picture on the left, okay? You got your pine trees. You got your snow-capped mountains in the background. So what are we noticing about the climograph here? Still gets warm in the summer. Again, I know this is the northern hemisphere. Uh, 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 
location because of the warm January, uh, June, July, and August. And in the winter, obviously, temperatures are going to be below freezing on average because we are talking about the far northern regions, or again, this could be in the southern hemisphere near the South Pole as well, but we're mainly talking about the northern coniferous forests here. Uh, and again, I know that because of the warmer temperatures here in the summer. And you'll notice the precip, okay, you're not going to get as much as the temperate deciduous forests like here in Ardsley, but we get precipitation. And what you'll notice is, again, generally throughout the year. It's not like you have a dry season and a wet season. Uh, it's pretty much general. Uh, you can get precipitation any month uh, in that northern coniferous forest. All right, so let's talk about these forests again in a little more detail. Tropical rainforest, our hot, high moisture air. Again, we saw that in the climograph. Stratification of special, uh, spe specialized plant and animal niche niches. We'll talk about that in a second. Rapid recycling of scarce soil nutrients. So unlike the desert, uh, where the recycling takes forever, in a, in a tropical rainforest, you get rapid recycling, but scarce soil nutrients. So that's very important. The soil nutrients are actually not that great in a tropical rainforest. The soil is not that great. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about soil uh, and farming and things like that. Uh, but that's why it's so sad when people chop, uh, chop down tropical rainforests to plant crops because the soil they're using is actually horrible soil. So not only are you killing biodiversity by getting rid of our tropical rainforests, but the plants that you're growing have a hard time to actually grow because the soil is not very good in a tropical rainforest. It doesn't have uh, a lot of nutrients. All right. Why, what is the important of impact of human activities in the rainforest? I just told you. Okay, when you chop down rainforest to grow crops, you're not doing yourself any good because, again, you're killing biodiversity and you're planting crops uh, in soil that has scarce nutrients, that isn't really, really good soil for planting crops. But why are these tropical rainforests so biodiverse? Remember a couple of chapters ago, uh, I talked about how most of the Earth's biodiversity is, uh, is in these tropical rainforests, which there aren't that many of them around. The reason is the stratification of these niches. So what this, what this is basically showing you is that you can have all these creatures living in the same area of the forest and they don't compete with one another for food and resources. Why? Because the harpe eagle is living at the top of the rainforest and, and interacts with species and, and things that are at the top. The, uh, the, the uh, toucan, right? The parrot, he's living in the middle of the tropical rainforest and he's interacting with everything in, in this middle canopy here. The understory, the, the the possum. Okay, he's living in this understory again, a, a little bit, a little bit up, but not all the way up to the top of the tropical rainforest, and just interacting with creatures and, and, and resources in this area. And then at the bottom here, you have the shrub layer, the ground layer. Again, the tapir, the the uh, black crowed and Pitta, okay, living in these areas, but again, they're not really competing with each other for resources because they're living in different areas, these different layers of the tropical rainforest. This is why tropical rainforests and forests in general have so much more in the way of biodiversity than, let's say, your deserts. Your deserts, you don't see something like this with a, with a canopy growing up from, from the ground. So in a desert, the little resources you have, everyone's fighting for the same resources. You can't get a lot of biodiversity. But in a forest, okay, uh, you can because you have all that is heightened meters, zero to 45 meters up into the sky, all these creatures living at different levels, just competing with creatures at, that, at their level. Never dealing with the toucan, never deals with the with, with the tapir. Okay, they're not fighting for the same resources. And so you can get huge, huge biodiversity in these forests, okay? Be it the rainforest or the tropical, the temperate forest like here in Ardsley or the uh, or the uh, northern uh, coniferous forest up, up, up in the Arctic areas. Doesn't matter. You have this, this tall canopy. You have this, uh, all this stuff, the emergent layer, the canopy, the understory, all these different layers. Each creature can live in its own layer, just compete with creatures in that layer, and this allows for a lot of biodiversity. All right, temperate deciduous forests, again, cooler temperatures, but abundant moisture. You have the broadleaf deciduous trees. Those are like the ones here in Ardsley that lose their leaves in the uh, fall season. Slow rate of decomposition, okay? So things aren't de decomposing quickly. They're slow in the forest. And again, what is the impact of human activities on those temperate forests? Again, when you cut down these forests, uh, you're, 
again, areas where you can get a lot of biodiversity, you're basically uh, destroying that biodiversity or, or minimizing it uh, when you cut down these forests, okay? Uh, and once again, here's just a picture of, uh, this looks more like a northern coniferous forest here, okay? Uh, you'll notice the pine, the pine cones, the pine leaves there, all right? Coastal coniferous forest, also called our temperate rainforest. These are found in scattered coastal regions, ample rainfall and moisture from fog, and you have evergreen coniferous trees. So this would be the Pacific Northwest. I don't know if any of you have ever been uh, to uh, Washington or Oregon or maybe to Vancouver, Canada. I've gone skiing at Whistler Blackcomb, uh, which is up in uh, just north of Vancouver uh, in Canada. Those are your coastal coniferous forests. Okay, so they're like they're like. They're like rainforests in a way, but they're temperate rainforests, okay? They're not going to be as warm and as hot as your tropical rainforests. And then the cold northern coniferous forests, those are your pine trees, also called boreal or taigas, uh, basically south of the Arctic tundra. So before you get to the tundra, uh, you get these coniferous forests because, again, there's a little more moisture to be able to deal with the trees. And then when you get to the tundra and the desert, uh, the cold deserts, obviously the moisture, uh, the moisture will, uh, you're not going to have as much moisture. Uh, and once again, cold winters and short summers are what you get in those cold northern coniferous forests. All right, mountains now play an important ecological roles as well. So we'll talk a little bit about the mountain biome. So what are mountains? Steep or high elevation lands. Large portion of our world's forests are found in mountains. They're islands of biodiversity. What do we mean by that? Well, they're islands because if you think about mountain ranges, it's sometimes tough to get from one mountain to the other mountain, right? Uh, so this could be some of that, uh, that, 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 uh, that geologic... Uh, excuse me, that uh, geographic isolation that we talked about um, in, in, some previous, in some previous units, okay? You have these islands of biodiversity, but again, if you're on one mountain, it's tough to get to another mountain, so they're almost like individual islands. Uh, habitats for endemic species, they help regulate the Earth's climate mountains, and they're a major storehouses of water. They, uh, so they have a big role in the hydrologic cycle. What's the storehouse for water? Usually your snow cap, right? Snow peak at the top of mountains, all that snow that's there during the winter holds water. And then in the spring, that water, that snow melts, the water runs down the mountains and then is used uh, by other creatures, humans, uh, for instance, as well. Uh, once the, that water uh, runs down into streams and into aquifers and into lakes like you see here. So mountains play uh, important ecological roles for us. Uh, and, and again, uh, we need those. We need to keep uh, those mountain biomes uh, as pristine as possible. All right, final thing in the book here on Chapter 5, some critical concepts, the value valuation of natural capital. So what is this talking about? Well, uh, this guy, Robert Costanza, and his colleagues estimate that the economical value of ecosystem services by the Earth's forests to be over $15 trillion per year. Far greater in value than the amount of money the timber industry would bring in. This is what we're talking about, valuation of natural capital. Here we have ecological services that the earth provides for us. And when we take a look at the next couple of slides, you'll notice that the amount of money, if you put a value, and we don't, we don't do it enough. This is what we have to start doing. If you put a value on these ecological services, then you start to realize that the money you're making by cutting down trees, for instance, doesn't come anywhere near the amount of money that the forests give us back with their ecological services. So underpricing of natural resources when not considering the services they provide leads to unsustainable management. And that's what we do, right? We don't price in these services. If we priced in these services to our timber, the timber would be so much money that not a lot of people would use it, right? And we wouldn't be cutting down as many trees. We would come up with another way, uh, another way to do it. Maybe some type of synthetic wood or something like that. Use our brains, all right? But we're not really doing that, okay? So what are some important ecological services that we're talking about here? Pollination, clean water, seed dispersal, soil fertility, decomposition of organic waste, pest control, flood control, climate regulation, cycling of nutrients. Okay, these are all important ecological services that these biomes, be it mountain, be it desert, be it the forest, do for us. Uh, and we need to put a value on these so that we can understand when we degrade them, really what it's costing us because we don't know really because we're not putting the value. So here are some values 
that this guy, Robert Costanza, and his colleagues put on uh, some of these biomes. Look at the terrestrial biomes, the forests, again, over 15 trillion, grasslands, rangelands, over $12 trillion, croplands, 9 trillion, swamps, floodplains, over 1 trillion. Look at coastal marshes and mangroves. These are your aquatic uh, biomes, okay, uh, which we'll actually uh, get into a little bit more in some future units. But uh, 20 over almost $25 trillion in ecological services from coastal marshes and mangroves. Open ocean, 16 trillion. Coral reefs, nine. Marine shelf, almost six. Lakes and rivers, almost a trillion dollars in natural capital from those ecological services. So as you can tell, okay, it's a lot more money that uh, that these uh, biomes are helping us with their services uh, than we're making by cutting them down or getting rid of them, Can't, right? You, you, you pave over a coastal marsh to put up a condominium complex, you're not making $25 trillion, okay? You're not. So that's really what, 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 what we're talking about here, all right? So humans have disturbed much of Earth's land, about 60% of the world's major terrestrial ecosystems, again, terrestrial meaning land ecosystems, have, are being degraded or used unsustainably by humans, the human ecological footprint is spreading across the globe. And here are some uh, just major impacts on terrestrial ecosystems. You'll notice the deserts. We put in cities, destruction of soil and underground habitats by off-road vehicles, depletion of groundwater, land disturbance and pollution from mineral extraction. Grasslands, what have we done to them? Converted them to cropland. Release of carbon dioxide from burning grassland. Overgrazing by livestock and oil production and off-road vehicles in Arctic tundra, okay, obviously getting us there. Forests, clearing for agriculture, livestock grazing, timber and urban development, conversion of diverse forests to tree plantations. Tree plantations are not good. You think they would be, oh, we're, we're cutting down trees, we'll put in just all pine, we'll put on, you don't want the same type of trees. These tree plantations have the same type of trees that destroys biodiversity. You need different types of trees because different species uh, use those different types of trees as resources, right? So one species may like a maple tree, one species wants a pine tree for its resources. So if you just have all pine, you get rid of then all the diversity of the animals that use the maple or the oak trees, right? So you want different types of trees. Well, that's not happening. Damage from off-road vehicles are damaging our forests and pollution of forest streams. Uh, what about mountains here? Our agriculture, again, timber and mineral extraction, hydroelectric dams and reservoirs. We're going to talk about when we get to water, dams are really not that great for, for the ecosystem. Uh, you think you like dams, it helps, uh, helps with drought and stuff like that. Dams are actually ecosystem killers, and we'll talk about that uh, coming up. Uh, air pollution blowing in from urban areas and power plants destroying our mountains. Uh, and once again, that's soil damage from off-road vehicles. All right, so that is the last slide for Chapter 5. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. And once again, thanks for listening.